I want to take this time to talk about three of my favorite subjects, which is cows, genetics, and feed efficiency. So I'm going to get them all in. But before I do that, there's a lot of people and organizations that I need to acknowledge uh, for their contribution uh, to this project. This is a four and a half year project, major effort that we, uh, that we carried out. And uh, really there there's, uh, was a lot of work with uh, Dr. Jennifer Alhus at the Lacombe Research Station. We had uh, Paul Stothard, uh, um, Jiquan Wang, uh, and of course uh, Graham Plasto, and, uh, and Stephen Moore that was at the, uh, with Livestock Gentech. And then of course Wally Dixon, and I haven't got uh, a major person on here, which is of course Susan Novak, that went on to bigger and better things, uh, but was a very important part at the beginning of, of this particular project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how we got started. And there were some things that occurred during the time when we, had, when we started this project which had to do with serendipity. You know how it is in research projects where things happen that you really didn't expect and you just, uh, I guess we might say you just lucked out. Mm. Yeah. Forward. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Forward, please. There we go. Um, so one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about is, uh, let me just uh, back up here. That's right. Oh, I'll have that guy push him. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so what I want to do is talk about some of the challenges that go on in, in the beef industry. Um, you know, the beef industry has always been challenged with being more competitive, uh, worrying about food safety and disease, uh, environmental sustainability. I know I'm in, hooked up with a group out of, out of Australia and New Zealand and the UK, and they're really concerned, their countries are very concerned about reducing the environmental footprint of their beef cattle and their livestock species and of course biosecurity. And so when you look at the beef industry in North America and throughout the world, there is a real need to optimize the industry in terms of, you know, the utilization, the proper utilization of resources, um, better carcass quality and meat characteristics, uh, food safety and the environmental uh, impact. And I'll try to show you what I mean by that. Here's a great slide, and I always like to talk about some past successes because it really shows you what investment in research has done. Over a 30-year period from, let's say, 1977 to 2007, changes in animal health management, in cow-calf management, in pasture management, in how we deal with ruminant nutrition in a feedlot or in, in an environment, and a little bit of, uh, of things about genetic selection have growth, have resulted in reduced utilization of resources, which means fewer animals that we have to use to, for the production of food, less feed, less water, less land, and it all culminates in a 16% reduction in the carbon footprint of beef in North America. I like to use that term, the carbon footprint of beef, as an overall indication of um, of how efficient a beef production or a live pro stock production system is. You can see there in that little, uh, the little bar chart, the North American beef production system, both in US and in Canada, those first five bars there, essentially shows that we have a carbon footprint for beef at about 18 or 19 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of carcass beef. Very competitive uh, and even better, and we should use this more in terms of competitors such as Japan and Brazil. So this is, this is something very good. However, in doing this, we've made some very, very nice successes, um, uh, but we also have some tremendous opportunities. And here is one. And this, again, as I've said, is a reflection of the production efficiency of our various livestock species. So when you look at this particular slide, you'll see GWP, which is global warming potential over 100 years. Most of the species over a 30-year period have reduced their carbon footprint on the environment by around 15 to 25%. However, beef cattle and sheep, those two ruminant species have not. 
And this is a really uh, interesting, interesting uh, overhead because it really shows us that we have a tremendous potential in terms of improving the, feed of, the efficiency of feed utilization. And that was one of the whole reasons we got into this business about feed efficiency and the phenomic gap. Just at the bottom of the slide there, you can see the competitors, our protein competitors that, 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 we're, that we're really competing with. Uh, you know, pork is around three to four kilograms of CO2e, uh, chicken around two, dairy around one, and beef is right up there, uh, you know, 18 in North America and 36 um, in, in other um, countries. I like this slide really because it tells us a lot about how we got into the business of the phenomic gap. And really what it says is that the advancement of technology starting in you know, 2001, particularly in genotyping, was moving at a very fast rate. It was essentially equivalent to Moore's Law. And those of you who maybe can recall Moore's Law, it has to do with the computer industry and how often they were adding uh, semiconductors and transistors to integrated circuits. And they were essentially adding these to these integrated circuits, you know, doubling their capacity in terms of computing power and in terms of memory uh, every two years. And essentially what was happening, of course, the price was dropping uh, by 50% every 18 months or so. So that was Moore's law and it was sort of the standard that most of our industries went by to say, man, we're really doing well. We're progressing at a very rapid rapid pace. If it, you look at the, uh, what was going on with genomics and, and how uh, we, the, the, industry was, the industries were developed when it came down to sequencing and genotyping, it looked like for about five or six or seven years we're essentially following Moore's Law. Uh, I'll pick out some nice uh, points there for you uh, where I have that first uh, little, little bar there if I have a, a pointer. Mm. There we go. So right here, right in this area here, 2003 was when the first human genome was fully sequenced at a cost of 2.9, 2.7 billion dollars and it took them 15 years. So at this point, base pair, so this is sort of the price of sequencing, so it'd be about three cents a base pair. And one of the things you should know in a human, human genome, there's three billion base pairs. So lots of money, it costs a lot of money. In this particular area right in here, this year, in about 2009, the first bovine genome was fully sequenced at a cost of about $50 million, so quite a bit less, and four years. And so here, the cost of you know, sequencing was about $0.003 per, uh, per base pair. Interesting, the Phenomic Gap Project was proposed and approved right there. And essentially, that placement of the Phenomic Gap Project, the project that I'm talking about, got us in a position where our genotyping costs dropped dramatically. They dropped by almost three times, two and a half times. And then, of course, right here, even the price has dropped again. So, so, so essentially, we've, we're, we're decreasing in price, and pretty soon it'll even be lower than this. So what's happening here is that the genomic or the genetic industry was progressing so rapidly and decoding um, DNA and sequencing DNA at such a rate that, that it really couldn't keep up. It was going faster than we could phenotype. And so essentially we had all of this genetic variability that we were looking at but we had no phenotypes associated with it. And this is particularly true in the beef industry. The beef industry really wasn't doing a, a big job in terms of phenotyping for difficult to measure traits. And that bridge, that loss, that gap, we call the phenomic gap. I think the first time I heard the phenomic gap actually came from Graham Plasto, that he, I might even give him the credit for, for coining the word uh, the phenomic gap. So really, we see, there's many of us see, see genomics having real potential in terms of aligning or helping align the, the beef industry and move it forward, not only the beef industry, other livestock industries. And this is for sort of like the social license, the social license for producing food. It's about not making more money, it's about safe, affordable for consumers, environmentally sustainable, 
right? We have to look after the environment and of course we want to be profitable. And in a world where we're moving towards 8 billion people in 2013 and 9 billion in 2015 and a 55% increase in the demand for meat, you know, there is, there is definitely a potential here to, uh, to, to use genomics as a, as a solution here. Oops. Can you move it back one? Thanks. So this is a really, um, a really, you know, simple example of what the phenomic gap entails. Essentially what we did is set up a breeding structure where we would commission about um, four large commercial herds, both in, be in the province of Alberta, but as well in research stations. And then what we would do is use sires that had known phenotypes and we would use them to produce progeny. And those calves or those offspring would then go right through the production system from birth right through to slaughter. They would be processed in uh, Alberta plants, Cargill, IB, well, uh, um, XL at that time. And um, we would track them for quite difficult uh, to measure traits. So in terms of an objective, our objective was very clear. We were going to do large scale phenotyping and genotyping, so 50,000 SNPs we would be looking for, for difficult to measure traits like residual feed intake. That's just another word for feed efficiency. I'll explain it in a bit body composition, meat quality and palatability, and uh, another colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, Chang Shi Li, is working on the fatty acid composition of beef, in other words, the healthful fatty acids. At the same time, we would be taking blood samples and would be genotyping. We'd take all that to Livestock Gentech and Delta Genomics, and we would have the genotyping done there. And of course, what we were looking for is the association being between our traits and the genotypes. Now, the other thing that went on at that time, not only did we kind of luck out on, uh, on genotyping costs and the advancements that were being made in, in, in genotyping, we also lucked out on a, on a basic technology that was being developed in Alberta at that time, and it was called Gross Safe Systems. When I first met, where's Camille? I know he's here somewhere, or he was here. But Camille Husma, when I first met Camille Husma, he was essentially working out of the basement or his garage making this world-class monitoring system. And essentially what it does is it is an automatic way of monitoring feed intake of ruminants or of any livestock species in a very harsh environment, which is a feedlot situation. This is hard to do, by the way. And he essentially, at the time when I, when I was working with Camille, and got, we purchased one of the first systems from it, the global capacity to measure feed intake using this system was about 500 animals, okay? 10 years later, or about 12 years later, the global capacity of this Alberta-based company out of Airdrie is now 68,000 and increasing. That is a tremendous growth, right? So we essentially used uh, the Grow Safe system to do a lot of our a lot of our monitoring. And we've also then, as I said, we've taken it on and worked with the Lacombe Research Station to, uh, to look at you know, various other phenotypes such as all of the carcass information and then all of the meat quality. And I'm, I've only thrown this up here to give you a flavor of some of the, the effort that it takes to do some of these traits. There's a lot of people involved in the background uh, measuring uh, meat quality and retail acceptability of, uh, of animals that we brought through our project. Now this is, looks a little cluttered, but it, it's a really interesting slide. Each of those dots on there represents one animal, okay? And it is for the trait residual feed intake. So what it says here is, here is all of the animals that we measured in the Phenomic Gap Project. We coined it PG1. Right? Just because we're too darn lazy to, to say it. So here's all the animals we worked with in PG1. But we've done a couple things. 
knowing that to do proper genetic association or genome association in terms of discovery of new SNPs or new bits of genetic variability, we need to combine this information with other large databases. So immediately under another project called the Canadian Cattle Genomics Project, we have combined our data with this is the University of Guelph's data set. And we've combined it with the Kinsella Dairy and Beef Synthetics. This is the old, those of you who remember Dr. Roy Berg, who is the father of crossbreeding, will remember that. We've combined the information there with the Kinsella Ranch and also with the Egg Canada uh, uh, population that's at the Kinsella Ranch, which is a purebred Angus Charlet. So we've immediately looked for other partnerships. Uh, I, I can't express how important it was me, for me to hear uh, Jeff, you say the importance of partnerships, and, and it's true, and the whole business about trust is, is really true in, in research as well as it looks like, obviously, in business. But we've done this, essentially, and, uh, and combined this really large data set. So this is about 7,000 animals moving to 10,000, and it's going to give us a really good base into the future. Just to explain what this is down here. What this residual feed intake means is, in a really simp simple way, is that what we've done is taken feed intake from an individual animal and we've adjusted it so we're comparing animals at the same level of growth and the same body size and the same composition. Like you're all the same and we know that that's not true, but that's what it does. And animals that are on the negative side means that they eat one to two kilograms of feed less per day than the average in the pen. So all of these animals below zero, and there's a lot of them, these are what we would call efficient. They are converting their feed very rapidly into protein and all those good things that we want, that we want to eat. And all these animals up here are inefficient. A good colleague of mine coined the phrase, and this was Dr. Erasmus Okine, he said, those animals are just eating for fun, okay? <laughs> Right? They're not doing anything with it. They're just gobbling up the food and they're eating for fun. So I always, I always like, uh, like that as a thing. So, so this is a very large database building. Under the phenomic gap, you'll see the deliverables that, uh, that we dealt with. Now the other thing that's going on with this, in, with this project and its association with the Genome Canada project is within the phenomic gap project, we have 13 animals that will be fully sequenced. Their DNA will be fully decoded, and that information will then help us do further analysis, and I'll explain that again. So this is just an example of three bulls that are very influential in the, in the database that are sequenced on Genome uh, Canada's dime, so to speak, and um, they're, they're important. They will join 300 other animals about 300 other animals from the Genome Canada project, which will then go into the Thousand Bulls Genome Project being led by Ben Hayes in, in Australia. So very large international collaboration. So we start off with a little phenomic or a big phenomic gap project, and suddenly we've expanded into an extremely large international effort. Now I want to sort of go through, I had to bring in a little bit of genetics, okay? So, so bear with me. But I want, to do, I want to do this just to show you how we're going to use that information from the full sequence to higher density SNP panels or, you know, knowing that genetic variability. I just want you to show that. If you can imagine, whoops, um, if you can imagine we know that half the genetic material for an offspring or a progeny or a child comes from the sire and the dam. This is one pair of chromosomes from the sire and one from the, da from the dam. So what happens during the formation of sperm and egg cells is that we get um, the splitting of, uh, of the DNA, the separation of DNA uh, as, it, as it is there. And what happens is during that process, there's events called recombination. Uh, sort of random bits of DNA on every chromosome will sort of hook together in the following way. Let me show you. So that little bit from there goes down to the progeny, and you'll notice that one there to make up half the genetic material to the progeny, and then from the dam, same kind of things happen. Now this isn't a random event, this ha well, 
part of it's a random event, but this happens on every chromosome, every generation, two to three times, two to three of these events. Now the beauty about that is if we have full sequencing on the sire or of the dam, or higher density panels up there, we can trace the information down to lower density panels for the progeny. In other words, we can take a relatively expensive 6,000 SNP panel and we can extrapolate or imputate information from 50,000 or even higher than that. So essentially, you're getting a lot of information for nothing. So I hope I've explained that a little bit, but it was, I always found it to be a, a, a rather interesting um, uh, slide. Okay, I'm gonna present another one to you just to show you that, um, that there is, this is more about the economic potential. And again, this is about residual feed intake, the res relationship between residual feed intake. So our measure of feed efficiency. The most important thing here is when we start genetically selecting for something, we have to worry about what else it's related to. So I select for feed efficiency and I get an animal that doesn't grow that, or something else happens, right? So this is not good. So what I want to do is show you a couple things with this slide. One is that this is a large amount of data. Again, each point is an animal. There's about 2,000 animals on that slide. On the bottom is our measure of feed efficiency. On our side is our measure, let us say, of growth rate. In, this is in the feedlot. The first thing we see from this slide is there is no relationship, right? That's what it shows you. It's just like you walked up there to that slide with a shotgun and blasted it once and you got this random pattern. But it also shows another very interesting thing is that there are efficient animals that are slow growing <laughs> and there are efficient animals that are fast growing. Doesn't seem to be right, does it? But there are, right? All those things here, these are slow growing animals and they're efficient and these are fast growing animals and there we got inefficient, fast and slow. Now look at the economic potential and this is what I think we're leaving on the table as a beef industry. Here I worked out a partial budget. So if you, if you really want to know how I did the partial budget, you can talk to, to me later. But essentially, here's some of the assumptions I made. But essentially works out how much money I would make off these cattle here uh, if I set these to zero. So here I'd make about uh, $42 a head if I had those cut type of cattle and could select for them or I could pick them. Interestingly, down here, I'm losing $170 a head for these types of cattle. I don't want those. Genetically, I don't want those. The feedlot doesn't want them. Same with here. I mean, so really what this is saying is there is a huge potential if we can use genetic markers, molecular breeding values, somehow identify those cattle that are giving us the high amount of profit and removing those ones that are, uh, that are on the, uh, the negative side of the profit index. Another slide, same animals, as you well know, we then took all those animals that we, in the feedlot, we followed them right through to Cargill. Uh, we got all the carcass information, we purchased back to strip loin, and essentially this uh, particular slide, uh, just to show you some data here, shows that there's no relationship between uh, Warner Bratzler shear force, which is, our, which is our measure of tenderness, and our measure of feed efficiency. So it says, if we go down and start selecting or getting molecular breeding values and using genomics to select for uh, feed efficiency, it will have no effect on product quality. So that is, that is definitely a, a good thing. Oops. Okay. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is just talk a little bit about uh, actually when producing uh, genetic merit values for for residual feed intake, just to give you an idea of some of, the, some of the economic benefit associated with it. During the Phenomic Gap project, there were genetic merit values calculated for almost 6,000 animals, sires, dams, progeny, offspring, and so on and so forth. What I did with this particular slide is I picked the top sires, okay? So I said, these are the ones that are the best for this particular trait. And they're the ones that are demonstrated right over here. So these are all really efficient. These are, these are the ones that convert their feed really well. And the, the, this is the genetic merit value for this bull. 
The average here of these 46 bulls that we'd consider top is negative 0.22. It means that their genetic merit means that they're going to save you 0.22 kilograms of dry matter feed per head per day in the feedlot relative to the average bull that you would pick, right? So that's quite a bit, right? Think about 365 days saving, you know, uh, almost a quarter of a kilogram of feed every day you feed that animal. And then the same thing over he here, uh, over here where I've got the heifers. So if I take these, these particular females and made them to those males right here through my little, my little diagram, uh, um, I'm not sure what kind of cow that is, but uh, it's a good one that I found. Essentially what you do in terms of these estimated breeding values is you, you add them together and divide them by two and you get the value uh, of how much saving you're going to do. When I did that, converted that to dollars, one generation of selection for residual feed intake, whether it's through a traditional method, estimated breeding values, whether it's through molecularly enhanced breeding values, you're going to save around $23 per animal per day, first generation. Can you imagine if you started to do this year over year over year? There is a tremendous potential here. Okay. The other thing that we did under the, under the project was we tested commercially available genetic markers. There are genetic tests, we call them molecular breeding values that are given, but genetic tests sold by some of the biggest companies in the world, uh, Mariel. Igenity, Pfizer, etc. Okay, and I'm not going to tell you which ones these are, okay, and whose they belong to, but over the length of the test, we te we looked at or validated, independently validated over 360 what we would call different equations for calculating molecular breeding values, and these are the results of the best ones. Okay? And really what it shows is if we look at the relationship between molecular breeding value for RFI, which is feed efficiency, versus actual, that's the actual trait that was measured, our genetic correlation is about 0.37. And don't, don't worry about the values. I'll show you what those mean in a bit. But it means that we can, of all these things, we can explain about 14 to 21 percent of the genetic variability of the actual trait we're measuring. The highest we can ever get is the heritability of the trait. So that'll be about 35 percent. So the highest number we could ever get would be 35 percent. So it's, it's pretty darn good that, that we're doing. But let me, let me try to put this in a different perspective for you. What does this mean? And I took this off the American Angus website because they struggle with this saying, okay, producers, what does this mean? What, 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 is, what does a genetic correlation of 0.4 mean? And so I took this off, off the American Angus site and they essentially break it down into progeny equivalents. And what that means is how many progeny would I have to test to get an equivalent accuracy of, of evaluation? So birth weight, as an example, has a heritability of, of uh, 42%. It means 42% of the variation is genetic. The rest is environmental. Um, the genetic correlation, according to the Igenity um, uh, genetic test, is 0.32. That's essentially equivalent to four progeny. That means that to get that same level of testing, I would have to, that was given by a molecular breeding value, I would have to test for progeny. Okay, what, what does that really mean in dollars? And I'll put it down here. Here's our levels. In our project, we had a genetic correlation of 0.37. Marbling was 0.4. Uh, tenderness is 0.44. That means that we have a progeny equivalent of about four to five. If I was going to test four or five progeny offspring, it would have cost me $1,600 in gross a fees, feed, and it would take six to eight months. So remember in the business, I think in business world, timing is expensive, time is expensive, and feeding cattle is expensive. And so when I break it down, then it has a lot of advantage. Being able to make the decision, instead of making the decision on an animal at 12 months of age or 14 months of age, 
I could make it at weaning time or at two months of age, that has a lot of value in, uh, in, in, as far as I can tell. Okay. The other thing that's gone on during the length of the, the project, and I'm pretty close to being done here, so, uh, so um, during the length of the project, the number of companies and breed associations that were involved in uh, genotyping by SNPs has, has increased dramatically. When I first started, there was really a few. There could have been the Angus Association. There was, of course, Beef Booster, which is a hybrid seed stock company, and, and those two might have been it. But here are all the examples and just some of the things that are being done under, under them. I'm sure I forgot some, but Beef Booster is doing it. Desiree Ranches is, is doing it. Canadian Charley Association is doing uh, more testing for feed efficiency and for SNP genotyping. Angus Association, of course, Limousine, Semental, the Hereford Association will be testing 900 bulls over the next two and a half years about, and we'll do 50K genotyping on those, and those will go to Livestock Gentech. Okay, so in conclusion, what can genomics do right now? What does it do right now? Well, what it does is it, cre it, 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 it creates predictive uh, measures or predictive values for hard to measure traits. These traits that we measure are expensive. And so while the, the genetic correlations are what we call weak to moderate, they have definitely improved. When I first started, the best genetic correlation I could get was 2%, okay? That's the best. And we wrung our hands over it and went, man, the science is wrong or something. But now we're starting to get to 14 to 20 percent quite routinely. We have made a lot of progress. So that's, that's valuable. This is early in life genetic evaluation. We don't have to wait until the animal is 12 months of age. We could essentially evaluate the animal when it was born. Okay? So good. So early in life. Of course, parentage. Parentage, knowing the sire is really important in, in any livestock industry because there are some sires that produce one offspring and there are some sires that produce 40, okay? The difference in value and income between those is, is tremendous. And then the last is marker-assisted management. I haven't talked about that and I'm not going to do re that right now. Uh, we can talk about it later. I just want to get to these conclusions. And these are some of, the, some of the sayings that I picked up over the time that I thought were really good. This first one is, is from Mike Coffey from the Scottish Agricultural College. And he said, in an era of genotypes and, and, and genomics, phenotypes are still king. Really what it means is we can, we can genotype like crazy, but we still need the phenotypes, right? Otherwise, we're nowhere. Steve Miller said this one. He said, we're at the beginning of a revolution in livestock genomics. It'll be a very short time that he envisioned that we could come up with a $5 parentage test, in other words, to know dad, okay, to know who dad is. Um, but it would have other things, other trait markers associated with it that would give the producer a $50 value. Well, you know something? We're almost already there. We're close to a $5 parentage test, maybe a little further away in $50 of value per head to the, back to the livestock industry. And the last one is from um, uh, Allison Van uh, Eneman, is the beef industry, and I'll paraphrase her, the beef industry has to change structurally. It has to become more vertically integrated. This is important. Structurally, if the, if the livestock industry does not align themselves so that they can transfer data up and down the supply chain, um, you're not going to be able to take advantage of genomics. Thank you.